takes the chief of staff of the army to quiet a room like yes, that. Instantly. That is that is a command uh, command presence. If ever I've seen or heard one. Well, thank you everyone for coming today for our military strategy forum. I'm Kathleen Hicks. I direct the international security program here at CSIS, and it's my great pleasure to be sitting down today with the chief of staff of the army, General Mark Milley. General Milley has commanded at virtually every level within. Uh, the Army and uh, obviously all the way to the top of the Army. He's served um, in places as far flung as Afghanistan. You've supported operations in Colombia, really and I every. I with you. We have served together. You have served in the Joint Staff and in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Um, so I think there's probably no one better situated to understand the complexities inside Washington, let alone the entirety of the Army enterprise. Um, you are also. Um, uh, graduate of Princeton, uh, you graduate of Columbia, and uh, you are a graduate of uh, the Seminar 21 program at one of my alma maters, MIT. And that brings us to the most important fact of you because it, it's close to your home in Winchester, Mass, where you were born. And the most important thing to know about General Milley is he's a huge Red Sox fan, which makes him, That's right. yeah, makes, makes him, him okay in my book any That's day right. of the week, right? So hopefully this is the end of the June swoon. That's and right. July will bring That's us right. a better month. Um, I do want to just mention uh, our general <clears throat> safety precautions. You can see there's doors at the back of this room that lead to the back of the building, and there's uh, uh, large glass doors behind you. Um, should a fire alarm or something like that go off, I direct you on where to go. And there is across the street uh, St. Matthew's. Uh, and there's also a bar. So depending on how uh, things go, we can pick one or the other. Um, and back behind us, we have National Geographic, which, uh, which is our assembly point behind us. I'm an Irish Catholic, so I could go to one before the other. You go to one and then the other. You, you choose which order. Uh, you can, that's a whole other conversation you can have. Um, so let's start now. It's, it's probably the most important thing happening in world affairs today is the British vote. Um, so I would love to get your take on what the challenges are as the Army looks out into the future. And if you wouldn't mind starting with Europe. Um, in, in honor, if you will, of, of all the events that are happening there today. It would be great to hear how you think about building an army for the future in light of the challenges that you see out there. Well, I just got, uh, thanks, Kath. I just got back from uh, Europe uh, about 10 days ago or so, something like that. Uh, went over to uh, the UK, met with my counterpart there, and went to France, met with my counterpart there, General Bosser, and then uh, went to Poland and uh, was there for the D-Day celebrations and all that. Uh, a lot of things happening in Europe. Uh, strategically, uh, as it relates to us, uh, I think that uh, Secretary Carter has kind of laid it out as the five challenges, counterterrorism, which we think is uh, very significant, and, and counterterrorism, you know, read the fight against ISIS. Uh, that's going to go on for some time. Uh, and then he laid out four other challenges, uh, Russia, China, uh, North Korea, and Iran. Uh, so in Europe, obviously, uh, there's two of those that specifically impact, they all impact, but there's two of those that specifically impact. First is uh, the counterterrorism fight uh, and the instability in the Middle East, which is creating huge amounts of migration. Uh, that's probably, uh, depending on which country you are, that's one of the top security issues that any European country is facing. And then, uh, and then the uh, you know, Russian behavior over the last, I guess probably since about 2007, eight or so, Russian behavior is have uh, been markedly aggressive and, and, uh, and they've been uh, acting in ways that are not necessarily in the United States' uh, interest or in uh, NATO's interest, and, and they've been acting in ways that are uh, exactly counter to that. Uh, Russian behavior has been uh, very, very problematic and a lot of concern. So those are the two big security issues. Uh, I'll stay away from the, uh, the vote because it's ongoing and it'd be inappropriate sure. for me as a, as a professional military officer to talk about the vote of uh, some other country's internal politics. So I'm, I'm going to stay right. away from that. No, please do. Yeah, yes. Just as a launching point to get you to Europe. There's some Brits in the audience, and they are more than welcome to take them on. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll stay away from that. Um, so moving on from Europe, you've talked about Europe. You talked about the CT challenge set. Um, what are the other big trends that are happening either geopolitically or in terms of innovation that, that are um, shaping how you think about the Army for the future? Yeah, there's... Um, you know, sort of the, uh, the grand strategic worldview sort of thing. And this mm -hmm. is my own personal view, not, not Department of Defense, not even Department of the Army. But I, I think there's some very broad uh, uh, trend lines that mm -hmm. 
are occurring in a wide variety of fields, uh, economic, demographic, military, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, one of the things, for example, it's obvious everyone sees it, uh, is a significant economic shift uh, in, in global economic power and distribution of wealth and goods. Mm -hmm. uh, from a North Atlantic-based global economy, which it's been for, I guess, four or 500 years now, uh, to a North Pacific base. Now, we're in the middle of that transition. That's not complete. Uh, historically, that can take up to 100 plus years. So we're probably in the first 35, 40 years of that, really since 79, since Deng Xiaoping initiated his reforms in China. So there's this huge shift going on. Uh, will it, in fact, happen or not? It's probably a little bit too early to tell. But it certainly looks like that, and all the economists and, uh, have clearly indicated that shift. Uh, historically, when economic power shifts uh, to the extent that it's currently shifting, uh, military power soon follows. So we are seeing uh, significant advances and development in uh, Chinese military power. So the rise of China uh, is arguably uh, the most significant geostrategic issue of the century that we're in. So if I was a historian in, uh, say, 2116, and I was writing the history of this century, uh, probably the central geostrategic or geopolitical story I'd be writing about would be the relationship between the, uh, the rising power, China, and the status quo power of the United States. Uh, and that's probably the most important one that's out there. There's a lot of other changes. Uh, you know, we can talk about Russia and Iran and North Korea, and uh, we can talk about uh, all kinds of demographic and immigration. and. There's lots of other issues out there, not the least of which is obviously terrorism, which you know, with the tragedy of Orlando, uh, just you know, is yet another reminder. But, uh, but that's probably the biggest single mm -hmm. one. In terms of uh, how it makes me think about the Army, what do right. we do? Um, I would, the way I frame it, and the way I've given guidance to the Army staff, is we have a current fight, a fight that we're currently engaged in, uh, and that's the counter-terrorist fight. That's the fight against ISIS, uh, Al-Shabaab down in Somalia, and uh, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, uh, al Nusra Front, and the entire spectrum of radical terrorists that are out there, all emanating generally uh, from the Muslim dilemma, uh, which is you know, from Morocco all the way to Indonesia, from the Caucasus down to the Blue Nile. That region of the world uh, is in a, in a historic level of instability. Uh, that region of the world has got all kinds of systemic challenges that date back at least a century to the fall of the Ottoman Empire, uh, none of which are going to be resolved quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to take concerted effort from the, the governments and the peoples uh, of the region with a lot of help from the outside. Uh, and that's going to go on for a while. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the current fight. And it's difficult, it's hard, it's dangerous. Uh, then, then you have to look at what, what is possible out there mm -hmm. in terms of what we need to prepare for. And the SecDef's laid that out for us. So, He's told us to uh, size the force, train the force, man the force, equip the force, uh, to be prepared to deal with four other possibilities, uh, Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. So with China, I think of that as uh, my view is uh, China's taken a long view. Uh, they have published a variety of unclassified articles, uh, books, manuscripts, et cetera, speeches. Uh, that clearly indicate that they want to be the dominant political military power uh, in East Asia uh, by 2049, the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Revolution. Uh, they call it the China Dream. Uh, and they're open about it, they're vocal about it. Uh, they want to do it peacefully. Uh, they want to do it, in, according to them, they want a win-win strategy sort of thing. But they're unequivocal that they want to uh, push the United States uh, out of uh, our current position of dominance in the Western Pacific uh, mm. by mid-century. Mm. So that's sort of a longer term issue that uh, we are going to have to, we the United States and other countries are going to have to come to grips with. And in between those two is Russia and, and, uh, and North Korea. Uh, so we have to be prepared for that. That would, those potential, uh, you know, contingencies could happen, who knows. Uh, and you've talked before, I know, about the myths of, I yeah. think it's myths of land power. Can you talk a little bit about how, looking at that future, you know, we should be thinking about land power? Well, yeah, so each one of those uh, situations, each one of those things, 
is different in its very essence. Uh, it's different politically, it's different geographically, it's got the, the militaries of each of those countries are structured differently and so on. So they would each require a different solution. Uh, one of the things that is very common, uh, especially in the United States, is common elsewhere in other countries as well. Uh, but what I've labeled the four myths, is actually more myths, but I just picked four, uh, that are very common and that we should continually guard against. Uh, one is the myth of short wars. Uh, now, historically, there have been short wars. Uh, you know, the, the uh, Arab Israeli war mm -hmm, in 67 uh, sure. was relatively short, uh, although some would argue it's never ended. Uh, but, you know, in terms of military operations, it was short for that period of time. Uh, there's been other wars, the, the mid uh, or the 1870s you know, uh, and 60s wars between uh, Austria and, and uh, you know, the Franco Prussian War, right. those kind of things. So there has been historically rel some relatively short war. But for the most part, uh, history tells us that when two countries or more enter into armed conflict, that one or the other belligerent typically underestimates the length of time it's going to take to accomplish military tasks, uh, to accomplish their political objectives. Uh, and typically, wars tend to take longer and consume more resources uh, than people on either side. And obviously, at least one side typically gets it wrong, because both sides enter it thinking they're going to win. Right. And, and one side typically does not. So. Uh, the myth of a short war. I'm wary when I hear people, especially in American circles, uh, think tanks, newspapers, even in policy circles, I'm very wary and skeptical of anyone who propagates the idea that wars would be short, uh, short dust up. Uh, we can mm -hmm. do this you know, very quickly. Uh, this will be over in days, weeks, you know, that kind of thing. I'm very, very, I'm very skeptical of that and, uh, and, and I've been in my share. So the myth of a short war is one that we should all guard against. Another one uh, is the, the myth of you can win from afar. Uh, very common, very American. Uh, we love technology. Uh, we don't want to needlessly spend the lives of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. So uh, we're a well, relatively wealthy country, so we've always defaulted historically, uh, the American way of war, so to speak, has always defaulted historically to using munitions, standoff weapons, uh, heavy firepower in order to prevail. Uh, and, and I think that's not a bad thing. But we have to be careful to take that to the extreme that we could lull ourselves into thinking that you can impose your political will upon an opponent from a great distance, uh, from uh, the air domain or the maritime domain with smart munitions and standoff weapon systems. You can do a lot with that. You can shape battlefields, you can impose costs, uh, you can certainly send signals, uh, you can kill selected people, high value targets and that sort of thing. There's a lot you can do, but wars are different than all of the things I just mentioned. Uh, the whole purpose of a war is to impose your political will uh, on your opponent by the use of violence. So uh, to do that, it typically requires the full spectrum of, of land power, air power, maritime power, plus space, cyber, etc applied in time and space in order to impose your will. And land power is fundamental because politics is done amongst people on the land, and if you're going to impose your will, at some point in time, typically that's done on the land. Uh, uh, you know, I would put it at like 99% of the time it's done mm -hmm. on the land. So uh, that's one of the things that history tells us. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's an important myth to kind of avoid, is that you can just win from afar. Another one that sort of correlated that is special forces can do it all, and I'm a proud you know, veteran of special forces, and, uh, and, I, and we have the greatest and best, by far, special forces in the world. But special forces is just what its name implies, special. They are, they are designed, organized, trained, manned, equipped for selected special surgical operations. They are not designed, uh, trained, and equipped to win wars. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference. Uh, so special forces can do like offset weapons. They can, they can shape, they can do precision uh, strikes, uh, they can do raids, but winning a war is a different thing. Uh, that takes a na nation's fight wars. The Army doesn't fight uh, a war. Uh, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines don't fight a war. Mm -hmm. The nation fights a war. Uh, so there's a big, huge difference there, and we, we can lull ourselves into thinking that special forces is the, uh, uh, is the answer to everything. Uh, it's not, and, and those in Special Forces be the first ones to tell you. And then the last one, that another myth uh, that's kind of prevalent sometimes, is that armies can be, again, very American, that armies can be 
uh, regenerated quickly. Remember the what the Constitution says. The Constitution says that the Congress, uh, their job is to raise an army and maintain a navy. So the Founding Fathers even believed in that. So they thought, well, hell, I got, I got to build boats. So they're going to take a long time, so I got to maintain that. But I can raise or, or get rid of an army at will. I can just raise it all the time. And it goes way back in American history about militias, and we can automatically raise militaries. I think that's a, in today's world, given the time factors, the speed at which you might have to respond in order to deter an opponent or assure an ally, uh, the idea that you can raise armies, uh, land forces that can deliver the effects, you, political effects you desire on the ground, and you can do that in short order, I think is a big mistake. It's a myth. Uh, because you can't. It takes a long time to train a platoon sergeant, to train a, a battalion commander, uh, to build a unit. It takes a considerable length of time. This isn't, uh, you know, your instant pancake thing where you add water, mix, and throw it on the grill and you got a pancake. That, it doesn't work like that. So these forces take a long time, uh, as well as training, you know, Air Force pilots and Navy ships, crews, and so on. It takes a long time to create military forces, especially in the modern world. Uh, and, and given the complexity of combat operations today. So those are the four big ones, uh, I think, that are worthwhile people remembering. We're going to get to readiness in yeah. just a second because it comes to bear in particular, uh, I think, on, on those, those myths. Um, but just picking up the last item you mentioned, there is essentially direct, the, the Army is uh, going through a reduction, a drawdown. There is direction for the Army to um, have plans in place in order to regenerate, I think is the term of yeah. art. Um, you know, how comfortable are you with the planning and the structure that you have, even if not speedy, to grow the Army in times of national crisis? Well, it's a depends question. I hate to give mm -hmm. you a depends question. But depending on the, the nature and severity of the crisis at mm -hmm. hand, the American people uh, have a hit long history of, of calling to the colors. Uh, so if there were, you know, hypothetically, if there was a direct attack in America, et cetera, 9-1, for example, um, Americans will join up in a heartbeat. And then it's a function of time, you know, training and uh, getting them organized and equipping them and so on and so forth, and that takes some time. So I have no doubt the American people would be there if, mm -hmm. if, if necessary and the cause was of sufficient severity that it, it needed that level of uh, th th those kind of numbers. So uh, I'm not worried about that at all. Uh, the mechanics, though, right. uh, of regenerating force. Right. So one of the things, for example, is we go down to, uh, you know, we're projected in the president's budget uh, to go to a uh, 980,000 uh, soldier army, mm -hmm. uh, consisting of the regular army, the National Guard, in the United States Army Reserve. That's what our plan is by 18. And that's not a small army, by the way. I mean, that's almost a million soldiers. Uh, so uh, we are being cut, but uh, I don't want, I don't think people should overstate mm -hmm. that. I mean, a million person, a million soldier army is not tiny. Uh, but having said that, history tells us that depending on the situation, you might have to have more than that. And uh, if you had to have more, what are our capabilities to regenerate? So. One of the things that we want, we're going to try to do uh, is create uh, what we're calling train, advise, assist brigades mm -hmm. uh, over the course of the next uh, four or five years. And these would be structures that would look like the similar to, not exactly, but they'd be similar to the existing chains of command, the sergeants and the officers of infantry brigades. They wouldn't have the privates and the soldiers in them. They would have the chains of command. And their task on a normal day-to-day -day basis would be to deploy overseas to uh, advise, assist, uh, help train uh, partners and allies that we've been doing for 15 years consecutively and even before that. But things like what you see in Afghanistan and Iraq today. Uh, so those units would do that. Uh, and they would stay together for about three years. But you get a secondary benefit so that if there was a national emergency, uh, then we could uh, you know, I would assume people would volunteer. Mm -hmm. And then we could take uh, soldiers and put them through basic training in AIT. So, you know, four or five months worth of training sort of thing. Uh, and then marry those soldiers up to those existing chains of command. Uh, and then run them through collective training uh, to get them ready as a unit. 
that would considerably shorten the length of time it would take to create units right. of brigades and battalions. So that's one thing we're doing. Yeah. Uh, and there's and several I, other if things. If I can just doing. add, yeah. you know, I think to the untrained eye, they might say, well, that's a top heavy structure, that's a hollow structure, but yeah. it's intentionally done, is your point, yeah, in order a, to it, create the. We, we actually did this before. Uh, in fact, I was in one of these battalions. That's part of where I got the idea. They were called cohort battalions. Mm -hmm. uh, this was back in the, uh, I guess it was in the 80s sometime. Mm -hmm. So we took chains of command, we trained them together, uh, and then we married up the chains of command with all the soldiers who came through basic training in IIT. Uh, and then you had what was called cohort battalions. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea was cohesion. So the idea was if the unit chain of command trains together for three or four months, they're very cohesive. And then all of the soldiers go through basic training together. They all go through advanced individual training together mm -hmm. at Fort Benning. Uh, then they will be cohesive. Um, and then when you marry them to the chains of command, uh, the amount of time it will take to build a cohesive unit uh, will be shortened. Right. And it was. And those were incredible battalions. Mm -hmm. It was also very expensive to do it. But it was, so the program was canceled. But it, those were incredible battalions at the time. Uh, this idea is. Uh, it's not hollow at all. They, these guys would be operationally used all the time. Uh, there's a little flavor of special forces in there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a flavor of the foreign area officer program. The, mm -hmm. These people in these units would get cultural training and mm -hmm. language training and that sort of thing. They would be second commands. Mm -hmm. uh, so a company commander or battalion commander in one of these advisory brigades uh, would have already commanded uh, a company or a battalion before they commanded one of these units. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you get, I, I look at it as you get a twofer. You get the day-to-day -day engagement that combatant commanders want in order to train, advise, and assist. And then in time of national emergency, you have at least four or five brigades worth of standing chains of command that can marry soldiers up like the old cohort units. And you will have units pretty quickly. Right. So, so let's talk about readiness, which is you, you've made very yeah. clear since you've, you walked in the door as um, chief of staff of the Army that it's the number one priority for you. Right. Um, you talked a bit about the security environment today in the future. Um, certainly today it's challenging operationally. I wonder if you can talk about how you see the readiness of the Army today. Uh, are we measuring it the right way? And um, you know, how, how, should we, how comfortable should we be about where we are and where we're going? I have a lot of concern about readiness, and that's why I made it uh, our number one priority. But the very first time, and anyone ever says the word readiness, the first question I ask is readiness for what? Mm -hmm. What do you want me to do? And then I'll tell you how ready I am. So I got to know what the tasks are, what the, uh, what the overarching uh, idea is. So when the Secretary of Defense says, you know, man, train, equip, make ready your units for counterterrorism, uh, you know, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, well, that's a different set of requirements, right? So to fight ISIS, or to fight the Taliban or Al-Qaeda, or to fight the North Korean People's Army. Those are two different military tasks, mm -hmm. fundamentally different. Uh, and you approach them differently, and you train differently. Uh, so my, when I became the chief, and, and it predates me a little bit, when I was at Forcecom, uh, and even at Three Corps, and it was widely recognized among those of us in the Army, to include the former chiefs, uh, that we have been, and this is no surprise, we've been fighting the Army has been fighting a single typology of war for the last 15 years. We've been decisively engaged uh, in a counterinsurgency, counterterrorist fight, fund mostly in Iraq and Afghanistan, but elsewhere uh, as well. But we have geared and re-engineered our forces, our structure, our training, our training exercise, et cetera, to fight that fight. Uh, and we had to adapt. Uh, so we went into the fight with a highly conventional force uh, in, say, 2003. We realized that we were running into some challenges with uh, insurgency and guerrillas, and we had forgot some of the tactics, techniques, and procedures we had learned in years gone by. So we had to re-engineer ourselves. So we adapted very quickly, and now we have an army uh, that institutionally has a lot of knowledge, skill, and experience at fighting terrorists and insurgents, uh, specifically in the Middle East and in Southwest Asia. But the cost of that was we stopped training for the most part uh, in higher end combat operations, combined arms maneuver type operations, uh, where uh, a battalion or a brigade uh, would go ahead and 
you know, have to coordinate and synchronize close air support and attack helicopters and long range artillery fires and bring them all together in time and space to defeat an, uh, a foe. And we stopped doing that. And we've stopped doing it more or less for about a decade and a half. So those skills have atrophied. So if you're a major today in the United States Army or below, your only point of reference, your baseline uh, for warfare is fighting from fixed static you know, combat outposts and forward operating bases in Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, dealing with indigenous tribes and mayors and uh, local leaders, uh, and fighting essentially uh, either terrorists outright flat-out terrorists or uh, some, you know, form of guerrilla warfare, light infantry type stuff. That's your only basis of reference. Uh, to then be told, you're going to go ahead and deal with the North Korean People's Army uh, or the Russian Army or, or, you know, pick your nation state. Uh, that's fundamentally a different set of skills. So we have got to uh, uh, retrain, retool ourselves uh, because this is the United States. Uh, we're the United States Army, and we have to be able to deal with a range of military operations, not just a single typology of war. So uh, we've done that. We issued out guidance, uh, and at the training centers, we're, we're retraining on the higher end skills. Uh, to give you like a flavor, uh, if you were uh, uh, pre-911, an artillery battalion would typically fire their artillery gunnery what we call Table 18, which is battalion collective artillery. You'd do that a couple times a year. Mm -hmm. uh, tanks would typically uh, fire you know, their gunneries at, at higher levels uh, several times a year. A master gunnery sergeant, uh, which would be a senior non-commissioned officer in a, in a tank battalion, he would have you know, 10, 15, maybe up to 20 gunneries uh, behind him before he's a master gunner. Today, that's not the situation. You'll see master gunners now in tank battalions that are uh, three or four times they've had gunnery under their belt. Uh, you've got artillery majors that have never seen an artillery battalion fire. They've, we've been firing one and two tube missions in Afghanistan. Uh, you have Apache units, uh, helicopter units, that have never flown a, a, an Apache battalion attack. Uh, they, everything we do in, is always one or two gun ships mm -hmm. for the last uh, 15 years. The, in, in some ways, the same is true in the Air Force and the Marines. So uh, we're retooling ourselves. It's going to take us a little bit to get back up to the level of uh, skill and standards that we think are necessary in today's world and what we see in the future. Uh, and, and it's, it's expensive, and it'll take a little bit of time. Well, and part of that future, as you've described, as you said, is it's, it's across the spectrum. It's, it's multi-mission. And so you also, at the same time, don't want to lose that incredible wealth of No, we don't. Uh, so what I've, told them, have. what I've told them was we, we can't throw the baby out with bathwater here. So uh, post-Vietnam, we shut the door on counter-guerrilla and counter-insurgency. Mm -hmm. And we went right to the full gap, right? We can't do that. Uh, and this is not uh, back to the future. Uh, because the, you know, the, the past is not going to be recreated. We, can't, we have to sustain our ability to engage in counter-terrorist and counter-insurgency fight. That's not, that fight's not going away. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that fight's going to be with us for a while. So we have to sustain that skill set throughout the formation, throughout the force. But at the same time, uh, we have to be able to fight a combined arms maneuver fight. And, and we're using the term... Um, Decisive action training environment. That's the term we put on it. What it really means is we have taken lessons learned uh, from what we've seen the Russians do in Ukraine, for example, or Crimea, or what we know that the North Korean People's Army is, is, are capable of, or the Chinese Army, et cetera. And we've sort of kludged them all together in this hypothetical enemy capability. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we developed scenarios that are hypothetical so that we could train at the higher end skills uh, and, and and it's against a specific against what we're calling a hybrid threat. Uh, and the hybrid threat would consist of uh, conventional forces, uh, heavy electronic warfare, heavy cyber warfare, uh, heavy enemy precision guided munitions, uh, contested airspace, which the United States hasn't had a contested airspace since World War II or the Korean War, uh, heavy enemy air defense, 
uh, very sophisticated enemy special forces, right. uh, very sophisticated uh, use of enemy uh, mechanized and armored formations. And then, of course, we would also have terrorists, guerrillas, criminals, uh, and all sorts of other complexities on the battlefield. And that battlefield, that hypothetical battlefield, is what we try to recreate in our training environment at the National Training Center, General Reyes Training Center over in, in Europe. Uh, so, so that's what we're training against right now. Yeah. Uh, both, so we have to sustain, right. you have to do both. You have to walk and chew gum at the same time. So um, we're gonna get to resources, I promise, yes. because it's, yes. I'm sure it's in the back of everyone's mind as it is in mine right now about how expensive it is to do all that. But let's talk about innovation. I think. Um, we've talked before about the fact that when many Americans and even defense folks um, think about innovation um, and forward-thinking um, services, the Army is not necessarily at the top of that list in their minds. Army well, minor, you need to change their mind. You need to change their mind. So what, exactly right. So what are, um, how are you thinking about Army modernization and then sort of next generation um, land warfare and yeah. uh, how are you driving that kind of change through the Army? So um, there's always a tension uh, between the future force and current force sort of thing and where do you put your money? And what you try to do, what I try to do, what the Secretary of the Army tries to do is create balance. Uh, you don't want to be imbalanced either way. Uh, so you have to be ready to fight tonight, so to speak. That's the readiness piece. Uh, but at the same time, you have to lay the groundwork for the future force because what you're really doing is you're laying the groundwork for future readiness, uh, for future equipment, technology, the how to fight, the way to fight. Um, so I'm, I am confident that we have the right way ahead on the first task, readiness. Uh, it's just going to take a little bit of time. We, we have sufficient money, we think, to, to do it and so on. Now, when it comes to the future force, which is our second priority, um, that's a bit different. So we've launched a, a, a very comprehensive project with uh, think tanks, uh, uh, a lot of scientists, uh, innovators, et cetera, uh, to try to figure out what that future holds. So the very first thing I want to do is try to figure out the operating environment. Uh, before we start saying your organization is going to look like this, your organization is going to look like that, or we're going to have this piece of equipment or that piece of equipment, uh, I want to first understand what the environment is. So if I'm in a tactical operation, for example, uh, I want to pick the red pen up first. I want to understand the terrain. I want to understand the geography. I want to understand the, the nature of the environment I'm going into, and then I want to understand the enemy uh, that I'm going against, right, before I decide how to task organize and what my tactic is to be. It's the same thing, only applied, the analogy is applied a little bit differently. So I want to understand the environment. So I've asked the staff, uh, intelligence agencies, and a wide variety of others to try to describe to me uh, what the world looks like between 2025 and 2050, that 25 year period. Uh, that's probably the area where realistically I could have some influence on as a chief of staff. So I want to know what that quarter of a century looks like. Uh, what does it look like economically, politically, uh, resource-wise, water, electricity, oil, all that stuff. I, I want to know what that world looks like. And obviously, the year 2025, 2030, there's probably more fidelity, and we can reasonably mm -hmm. make some predictions. As you get out beyond that, things get a little hazy. Right. I also want to know what technologies are out there. So I want to know all that stuff, or as much as I can, uh, by the end of this summer. Uh, before we can make some capital investments and decisions on organizations and equipment. But having said that, we know some things already. Uh, so we know, for example, um, that in technology, that there's tremendous work that's been done in robotics. Uh, we're already seeing the military application of it. Uh, the Air Force and the Navy both have extensive use, or we're seeing the beginnings of extensive use of, of robots, as an example. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's an area of exploration. Uh, we know that there's things being done, a wide variety of uh, things being done in terms of fuels. Uh, so to get away from fossil fuels to other forms of fuels, sure. and obviously military forces use a lot of fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, we know there's a lot of things being done in the area of shooting. Uh, so for, I don't know, five centuries or so, we've been using gunpowder-based uh, uh, propellants to mm -hmm. propel projectiles through the sky. And now there's a possibility of uh, using the electromagnetic spectrum, for example, rail guns, right. uh, lasers, 
Uh, so there's things in that realm. Communications technologies are just off the charts. Everyone's pretty familiar with that. Uh, and there's uh, things like nanotechnology. There's, there's a whole wide variety of technology. Mm -hmm. The question is, what, are, what will be the military application of these technologies? Uh, that for, for ground warfare. We know what some of them are already for air and maritime. But the air and maritime domains are fundamentally different than the ground domain. The ground domain is, you know, you just look outside. You've got cities, you've got urban areas, the space is all broken up. Uh, you've got mountains and valleys, uh, you have people, collateral damage, so on and so forth. Uh, it is not an ocean. Right. Uh, it is not the sky. So those domains are fundamentally different for the, uh, for the application of technology. So we're looking at all those technologies. My, my professional opinion is that I think we are on the cusp of a fundamental change in the character of ground warfare. Um, and let me explain that for a second. So I don't think there's a change in the nature of war. I think the nature of war is immutable. It's about politics, chance, friction. Uh, so I, th I think the, the nature of war has pretty, pretty well stayed consistent for the last you know, 10,000 years. But the character of war constantly changes. And it changes based on a lot of things. Napoleon changed the character of war not because of technology, but because of the French Revolution. He had a nation in arms. Uh, other things that have changed the, the character of ground warfare have been simple things like the introduction of a stirrup on a horse or rifling uh, the musket, uh, the introduction of a machine gun, the introduction of, uh, of tanks or wheeled vehicles in, to replace horses and so on. Those all fundamentally change the character, the how you fight sort of thing. I think we're on the cusp uh, of a fundamental change in the character of ground warfare. Uh, to, the, to such an extent and of such significance, uh, it will be uh, of such significance that it'll be like the rifling of a musket or the introduction of a machine gun, or it will have such significant impact as the change from horses to mechanized vehicles. Right. Uh, exactly what that's going to look like, I don't know. I just know that we're there. Uh, we're on the leading edge of it. I think we've got a few years to figure it out. Uh, probably less than 10, mm -hmm. but I think that by 2025, uh, you're going to see armies, not only the American army, but armies around the world, uh, will be fundamentally and substantively different than they are today. Okay, we're going to go to the audience in just a second, but I'm going to put a twofer in for my last question because there's two big areas that we haven't talked about that I want to make sure we touch on. Um, one is the total army, one army approach, which has been um, noticeably a part of your messaging. You talk, for instance, just in a significant signaling way about the army at 980. You don't talk just about the active components. So I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit from you about how you are um, ensuring, inculcating a culture in the army that is recognizing the, the comp how the components are contributing. Um, and second, not quite totally related, but I do want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about one of your other priorities, which is the troops and their families. And I'd love to hear just a little bit about what you are hearing as concerns out of troops and families um, in the environment that we're in today and, and how you're addressing that. So on the first one, on the total army piece, uh, and I have been advocating that a lot uh, from day one. Uh, our army, uh, we're the only one of the services, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, we're the only one of the services who has over 50% of the force in the reserve component, uh, either the National Guard or the U.S. Army Reserve. Uh, the other services are 20% or 30%, but we've got uh, well over 50%. So that's significant in and of itself. Uh, and, and the United States Army uh, is, in fact, one army, and it was designed that way. Uh, right after Vietnam, uh, one of my predecessors, Creighton Abrams, who was the last commander in Vietnam, and when he came out of Vietnam, he became the chief staff of the Army. When he was a young man, lieutenant colonel, uh, he commanded a tank battalion in World War II. Uh, he was at the Battle of the Bulge, he fought on the Patton, uh, and he was the lead tank battalion to uh, relieve the 101st Airborne Division at Bestown. Uh, he was a big hero, Patton called him best tank commander in World War II, and so on and so forth. So his formative years uh, was uh, a big win for America, for World War II, right? So, uh, and, and we won. So he comes out of that war, uh, and America was fully behind it, and we won. And then he gets, uh, in his final years, he's the commander in Vietnam, and we lose. The 
communists take over Saigon, they win. And it's that simple. And he knew it, and all the other senior generals at the time knew it, and the Army went through a deep period of reflection. So one of the reasons Creighton Abrams, whether he was right or wrong, I'm not so sure. It can be open to debate. Uh, but the fact of the matter is he concluded that one of, not the only reason, but he concluded that one of the reasons that the United States lost in Vietnam was uh, the will of the American people cracked. Uh, and remember, war is about politics, it's about will, and so on and so forth. And his assessment, Creighton Abrams' assessment, was that you know, Ho Chi Minh uh, wasn't just targeting the U.S. forces on the ground in the uh, Asia Valley, he was targeting the people, the minds of the American people back here. So he said, hmm, um, how, and, and one of the reasons he thought that was because he thought the American people were disconnected from the fight, as opposed to the fight he was in as a young man, World War II, where the American people were deeply committed to that fight. And he thought that uh, our will uh, was broken. Uh, and he said, how can I fix that? How can I connect America's people to the war effort? And I'm the chief of staff of the Army, how do I do this? And I can't you know, solve world hunger. So he says, I'll, I'll do an organizational change. I'll design the Army so the Army cannot fight a war without Main Street. I can't go to war without the senator from state X or state Y uh, coming along. With governor, the, you know, the governor of California, the governor of Connecticut, the governor of Mississippi, Minnesota, because uh, we're going to take forces from their states. Uh, I'm going to take Main Street with me to the next war. That's what, he, that's what he figured out. And he said, I will redesign organizations. So I'm going to take all the logistics, for example, or most of it, 66% of it, and shove it in the United States Army Reserve and the National Guard. I'm going to take massive amounts of combat power of the United States Army and put it in the National Guard. So that if America wants to do a raid, well, we can do that with the regular Army or the regular forces. We can do short duration, week or two, three weeks. We can do the Grenadiers and the Panamas and the Bin Laden raids. Uh, but if you want to go to war, America, then, then, you're, then America goes to war, not the Army. America goes to war. And I'm going to organizationally make it that it's impossible for America to go to war without America. So he linked the American Army as a people's army. He linked the American Army to the American people by a very you know, nifty little device called the National Guard and the U.S. Army Reserve. Uh, so today, what's the effect of that? And that stood the test of time since the early 70s. Uh, so today, it's absolutely impossible for the United States of America to conduct a sustained land campaign without extensive use of the U.S. Army National Guard and the U.S. Army Reserve. We can't do it. It's not possible. Uh, you can't get the beans and the bullets and the fuel, and we don't have sufficient combat power, and so on and so forth. And that is by design. Uh, so I recognize that. That and for us to be effective for the nation and to give options for the president, we have to have a trained and ready total army. It's not good enough just to have a regular army. You have to have a trained and ready National Guard and a trained and ready uh, United States Army Reserve. Uh, so I've put a lot of emphasis on it. Uh, I understand why Craig Davis did it. I believe he was right. And I'm trying to sustain that initial concept from a long time ago. Great. Troops and families, what's a concern you hear um, a lot? How are you addressing it? Yeah, so uh, I think that you know, people come in the military for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, I think the, from my experience, uh, I think the, the key things that have sustained the all-volunteer army at, of course, is patriotism, love of country. I think that underwrites uh, anyone coming in service. Uh, but in addition to that, education, uh, health care, and, and uh, you know, good housing, quality of life sort of thing. Uh, so that's, it, it's not the third priority so much as it's a constant priority. Uh, so I expect change of command to not just superficially in a name only take care of the troops and their families, but to actually do it on a day-to-day -day basis to live it as if they were your own family. Uh, Secretary of the Army has made it his, uh, his personal top priority is to, he's going to take that one on as his sort of personal project, Secretary Fanny. Uh, and, and this is something that every leader in the Army has got to look after. Uh, but those three particular areas, uh, medical care, education, and, and, uh, and housing uh, are three fundamental areas that uh, I think we all need to be focused on because they're of such importance to our families. 
and there's a direct, it's, it's directly linked to readiness. Uh, the way I explain it to commanders, you're not, you're not doing this because out of just sheer altruism, just because you, know, you want to be a good guy or something like that. This has direct linkages to readiness. 60% of our force is married. Uh, World War II, 10% was married. So six out of 10 soldiers today are married, and on average they have two children. So you're looking at a demographic, a force, that's fundamentally different in, than years gone by, and that began to change with the all-volunteer army. So even in Vietnam, it was 10% was married. So uh, to do that, to have a force like that, uh, normal human beings, uh, which soldiers are, uh, if you would ask them what's their you know, most important thing in their life, they're probably going to say their children, if they have children, or their family, their mm -hmm. spouse, or, or whatever, right? So if they think, if we have a soldier in our, if Iraq or Afghanistan or whatever the location is, and they think that their family has got a lousy house, there's mold in the, in the, in the bathrooms, that their medical care is terrible and they don't have medical care, uh, or they think that the neighborhood's unsafe, uh, that the water's bad, uh, and so on and so forth. If they think the quality of life of their family is not being tended to, then they're not going to focus on the task that we want them to focus on, which is closing with and destroying the enemy. They're going to be thinking about their family, uh, and that's going to be their primary concern. So it's incumbent upon us uh, as an institution to literally take care of the families of our soldiers uh, because there's a direct cause and effect linkage to readiness in that. So it's very, very important. Great. Okay. So now we're going to open it up. I do know that I didn't ask about resources, but I'm nevertheless well, we turning it over to then? you. Yes. So uh, please, when the mic comes to you, give us your name and your affiliation if you have one. We'll start right here in the front and just wait a second for the mic. No hard questions, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, John Harper with National Defense Magazine. Uh, General, I wanted to ask you a question about the joint force, and then since you mentioned robotics, just I have a quick follow-up in that regard. Um, some of the Air Force have been pushing to retire the A-10 in order to save money in a tough budget environment. Are you concerned that there's going to be a capability gap between the retirement of the A-10 and the development of the next uh, ground attack aircraft where the Army might not have the close air support that it needs? Uh, and then with regard to robotics, do you see wearable exoskeletons as a potentially game-changing technology? And do you anticipate that that will be used widely across the force? Thanks. Okay, one question <clears throat> per person. Yeah, get one question. I'll answer both of them, though. So, uh, just briefly on the A-10. Um, I, 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 as a soldier and a guy who's been in, in my share of firefights, the only thing I care about uh, is the effect on the target. I don't give a rat's ass what platform brings it in. I could care less if it's a B-52, if it's a B-1 bomber, if it's an F-16, an F-15, an A-10. I don't care if the thing was delivered by carrier pigeon. I want the enemy taken care of. So it's an Air Force decision. My job is to describe the target. Uh, and it's an Air Force decision then to do the weapon airing, the type of munition, and the platform that brings it in. Uh, and I can tell you as a soldier, uh, that the United States Army hasn't come under uh, significant enemy air attack, for example, uh, since, I don't know, Normandy or maybe the Korean War. That's it. So I have enormous confidence uh, in the United States Air Force. I mean, we have an incredible Air Force. It's unbelievable uh, that there's, there's no one on Earth who uh, even comes close to the United States Air Force. It, it's an amazing organization. And I can tell you with personal knowledge, they have never failed me. Uh, and you know, all the jokes aside about you know you're in the Air Force and the, or you know Marines or you know the inter-service rivalry type stuff. Go Navy, you know, go Army, beat Navy. Go Navy, beat Army. That kind of stuff. Put all that stuff aside. The fact of the matter is, when push comes to shove and uh, bullets are actually flying and there's people's lives at stake, the United States Air Force has never failed me, uh, and it doesn't fail the Army. Period. Full stop. And and I don't I don't care what the platform is. The Air Force delivers, they deliver on time and on target, and they do it every time. And, uh, and they're very, very good at it. So I have enormous confidence that uh, they will make the right decisions on the platform. And, and it's not really my place to say this platform or that platform. Uh, on the second one, yeah, exoskeleton, I didn't mention it, but exoskeletons or, or other materials. types of technologies and materials, those are all yeah. inside that uh, broad, uh, bin that I talked about as potential technologies that have some potential future application. They're not ready for prime time today, but we're looking at them and 
I think within 10 years, things like that are going to be uh, very, very possible on a battlefield. Okay, we're going to go right next door, right here. <coughs> Hi, Jen Judson with Defense News. Um, I wanted Was to you ask. From Defense News, where were you from? National Defense. Oh, yeah. same thing, right? <laughs> They're not two of us. <laughs> it can be confusing. No? Okay. <laughs> uh, where are you in moving advise and assist brigades from an idea into actual units? Do you think that we'll see this in the 2018 Palm? And you know, what what in terms of cost and time is this going to take? And where do you imagine you'll be drawing from within the force? Probably both active and reserve to complete them. Yeah, the numbers aren't the number. You, you're going to see it in the upcoming palms. Uh, the number, the numbers of people are not large. These are the change the command of brigades. Uh, so we're going to take it out of hide. We're not looking at expanding numbers or going back to Department of Defense looking for more people. So, um, and we're going to do one at a time. We'll pilot. You know, we'll do it like we do everything else. We'll we'll pilot it. We'll make sure we got the design right. We'll we'll take it slow at first not rush to failure and make sure we do it right. Uh, so we'll probably look at the first one uh, being real, uh, probably about, my guess is probably about two years from now, something like that, maybe in 18 or 19, in that range. Uh, and that the first one will be organized, it'll be real, we'll, we'll uh, use it with a combatant commander and then we'll tweak it for the next version. Uh, at the end of the day, what I'd like to do, and this may or may not be achievable, but what I want to do is uh, try to create uh, probably five of these, uh, one for each of the uh, geographic combatant commanders. Great, okay, and we're going one more down the front row. Um, hi, Madani Faleka from St. Albans School of Public Service. Um, you mentioned that the Congress raising an army as quickly as it's done in the past isn't entirely accurate today. Um, is there any part of the Constitution, especially the Second Amendment, that isn't applicable today, or do you believe it's necessary in the same capacity? I don't even know if that's within your writ, the Second Amendment question. I, I, don't know, I, can... I always wanted to be a lawyer, but, <laughs> but right now I'm not. So I'm not a constitutional authority, and I'll pass on any kind Very of the Second Amendment. Okay, and we have a question. I do believe in the Constitution. I swore an oath to defend it. There you go. Hello, Paul. Coming. How are you? How are you doing, sir? Uh, given uh, readiness is your top priority, the Army has historically sort of struggled in you know, communicating that impact. Uh, can you give some insights into, as you now are going about uh, assessing and communicating that impact uh, and play for you know, the competition of, of resources as well as the accomplishment of Army defense and national objectives? Yeah, you know, the. Uh, yeah, uh, every service chief has two hats. Uh, so I'm the chief of staff of the Army, but I'm also one of the six members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, and, and I look at myself as a joint officer, not just an Army officer. Um, and I caution everybody, hey, look at, uh, and, and I think the other service chiefs do as well. Uh, I, I don't want to be in competition with the Air Force and the Navy and the Marines. And, and stay clear of that. That's bad. It's toxic. It's it's poisonous, and like I said up front, uh, the Army doesn't go to war. The nation goes to war. It's the United States Army. Uh, and we go to war as part of a joint force. We go to war as part of an interagency force. And we also fight as a member, typically, of a coalition uh, or an alliance with partners and, and friends in, in other countries. Uh, it bothers me when I hear anyone say, uh, you know, the Army does this, or the Navy does that, or the Marines do this, and, you know, and they start beating their chest. Uh, they're fantasizing. Uh, I, I thought uh, Admiral McRaven was great when people say, well, you know, the SEALs took out bin Laden, and McRaven was on TV a, a couple of, I don't know, three or four weeks ago, and he said, no, the United States took out bin Laden. Uh, and the force that took out bin Laden, uh, the SEALs were the guys who went on the ground, uh, but it was Army pilots who flew them. Uh, there were Marines as a reaction force. There were Air Force aircraft and Overwatch, and so on and so forth. It was a joint force, and no single service goes to war. The nation goes to war. And we go to war arm in arm, and we are mutually supporting. So I talked to everybody about do not get involved, uh, and I personally find it offensive to uh, be in this, quote, resource battles and guard against it. It's bad business. Great. Okay. Thanks, Paul, for the question. 
We have one right back here. David, David Sedney, uh, thank you for a great presentation, Mark. Uh, my question is for both your hats. Uh, you mentioned Russia and hybrid warfare. Uh, in Ukraine, Crimea, the Russians use the so-called information cyberspace, whatever you want to call it, um, to, from RT to shape nation's wills, to dedicated denial of service attacks on civilian and military infrastructure, and social media to change the actions and uh, beliefs of p people on the ground. Where does the United States Army and the United States stand uh, in this area, and what role do you see the Army playing in it? Yeah, so uh, what we're doing in terms of cyber uh, is we are, we are building cyber teams, both offense and defense. Now, offensive cyber is tightly controlled, and I, I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but it's tightly controlled. Uh, what I'm more interested, frankly, and, and it's controlled by you know, higher levels, uh, NSA, president, that kind of thing. But frankly, what I'm more concerned about uh, and what I'm more interested in is defensive cyber. Our systems that we currently use to uh, conduct mission command, uh, to coordinate, plan, synchronize military operations, are uh, very dependent upon the electromagnetic spectrum. So um, we are dependent upon the global positioning navigation systems. Uh, we're dependent upon electrons all over the place. We're an electrical-based organization in society, for that matter. So, uh, and I know that seems common sense, you know, planes, ships, tanks, communications, all this stuff is based on somewhere, there's computer chips and everything, right? So I'm concerned about protecting that system because if that system fails, then what? You know, what if, for example, uh, the planes can't fly? Or what if once they're flying, they can't navigate? What if all these smart bombs suddenly become dumb bombs? Uh, what if ships uh, can't navigate or, you know, properly steer themselves? What if tanks, you know, I saw, uh, I think there was a thing on TV uh, probably a couple months ago, you know, where some hacker was able to take over your personal vehicle. Oh, right, oh, you yes, saw that? right, yeah. yeah. So imagine that. Uh, imagine uh, hackers taking over a tank or a column of tanks, that sort of thing. Imagine them getting into your communication systems and completely shutting it down. Uh, and imagine not having any access to GPS. So these are all vulnerabilities. They're not just vulnerabilities for us. They're vulnerabilities for the Russians, the Chinese, and other countries as well. But what, what I want to do and what I'm emphasizing in the Army cyber stuff is the defense. So at the National Training Center and the Joint Readiness Training Center, we've added into the scenarios in this hybrid scenario, in this decisive action training effort, is I'm assuming we're going to operate in a degraded environment, uh, and, and we're learning how to do that. Uh, and that takes a lot of work. Uh, so we're not going to have, you know, perfect systems working all the time. Uh, people are going to have to learn yet again how to read a map and a compass, a paper map and a compass. Uh, so there's things like that that we're doing, but it's all got to do with defense and protecting the system. Uh, that's my greatest concern when it comes to cyber. Okay, we have time for one final question. Let's see, why don't we come into the middle of this side. Good morning, Scott Massioni with Federal News Radio. Uh, the NDAA right now, uh, there's a possibility that you may have more troops uh, coming in or, you know, they're trying to increase the active duty and, and some of the total force. Um, what would that do to you in, in cost and capacity and training, all these different things, considering that you've been working on a drawdown since the QDR? Well, again, um, you know, it's, it's a depends question. Uh, I don't have a problem with more troops. I'd welcome more troops. I think that uh, that'd be a good thing if and only if there was sufficient money to maintain those troops' readiness. And that there, therein lies the tension. And I've said in open testimony uh, that increasing the number of troops without increasing the, the funding and the resources to maintain those troops to uh, sustain their readiness would actually have the opposite of the desired effect. It would actually decrease readiness and it would begin to hollow out the force. Uh, and, and that is not a direction we want to go. Uh, so I'm, I am comfortable uh, with the direction of travel that we are now. I'm comfortable with the, the budget as it currently exists. Uh, there is risk associated. I've called it high risk. 
Again, depends on the situation. Uh, when I say high risk, I'm specifically talking about multiple contingencies simultaneously against higher end threats. You know, if you had to fight Russia and North Korea at the same time, that would be high risk. So, uh, but given what we know of the near future, next you know, two, three, four years, uh, what I don't want to do, what I would ask people not to do, is increase the size of force, but not with additional money to sustain that force. If we did that, that would actually have the, the wrong effect. If you want to increase the size of force, it comes with a bill, you've got to pay for it. General Milley, I want to thank you for taking the time today. It's a very engaging conversation. I know there are probably many questions left unanswered, but we also know you're busy, and we thank you and the Army, um, the soldiers in the Army, for all their um, service to the country. Thanks, so please Kat. join me. In